Hello everyone. This is Malik and on behalf of Discover Financial Services and 451 Research, which is now part of SMP Global Market Intelligence, I would like to welcome you all and say thank you for attending today's webinar titled The Future of Payments, A View into Emerging Global Trends. Just a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. To ask a question, simply type it in the question box on your screen. We will get to as many as we can during the Q&A session. The presentation slides are available for download in the resource section in the console. And finally, the on-demand version of this webinar will be available shortly after the live event concludes. We welcome right. our speakers today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jordan McKee, who will be leading this event to kick it off. All over to you, Jordan. Thanks so much, Malik, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. We are very excited to give you a view into a recent study we conducted on the state of digital payments and fintech globally, and we're going to cap that off with a discussion on what Discover is seeing in the marketplace. So to begin, um, let's do a quick round of introductions. I'll kick it off. My name is Jordan McKee. I lead the fintech research and advisory practice here at 451 Research, which is part of S&P Global Market Intelligence. And I'm excited to be joined by three great panelists from Discover, Greg, Joanna, and Trib. Uh, guys, it'd be great if uh, you could each introduce yourselves and maybe tell us just a bit about your role and your position within Discover. Uh, Greg, let's start with you. Yes, hello and uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Jordan. My name is Greg Rains. I lead emerging products and solutions for Discover Global Network, um, really focusing in on kind of some of the new and emerging things that are happening, building and incubating new products and services that we, we didn't have previously. And then uh, the solutions aspect is more around working with big tech and fintech partners on, um, you know, solving their co commerce opportunities. Uh, Joanna. Thanks, Greg. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Joanna Hanner. I am a director within our corporate strategy and business development team. So um, I have lots of conversations with um, partners and with our different business units within Discover around kind of opportunities of how we can best grow our business. And then Trib. Hi, uh, I'm Trib Grewal. I'm uh, uh, head of, uh, of FinTech and commercial solutions or commercial payments for uh, Discover based out of London. Uh, and my team and I will look at uh, you know the um, emerging trends and the new fintechs and how we can partner with them to create new solutions and also how we bring some of those uh, solve some of those commercial uh, payments challenges. That's great. Thank you uh, to each of you for joining us, and we'll hear from you all in just a bit here. Um, first, I'm going to kind of set the scene on the study and share some of the key findings, and then we'll get into that uh, discussion around what you're all seeing in the marketplace. So this is our second year collaborating with Discover on a global survey of consumers and fintech vendors. Uh, from our vantage point, it's the largest of its kind, and it's fairly unique in the sense that it provides a view into how fintech vendors themselves are thinking about the market, which it generally isn't an Audience, we actually don't see called on too often uh, in, in the form of primary research. Really, the goal of the study was to better understand how consumers are leveraging different types of digital payments products and fintech services, uh, their preferences in terms of providers, who do they want to use these capabilities from, and their interest in different types of emerging use cases, things like connected commerce and open banking. And on the other side of the coin, the objective was to gain a view into the challenges that are facing fintech vendors. Where do they need support within their organizations? How are they thinking about partnering with incumbents in the payments ecosystem? And very similarly, what is their interest in pursuing different types of emerging use cases, running the gamut from blockchain to open banking to real-time payments? And I would say the overarching objective was really to provide a view into how both new entrants and evolving consumer demands are sort of coalescing and starting to shape how our market is coming together and, and really where it's headed in the future. Just quickly to kind of set the scene in terms of what this uh, research initiative actually consisted of, uh, we surveyed more than 4,000 consumers and 850 fintech vendors uh, located in North America, Europe, and Asia, uh, specifically the US, Canada, UK, Germany, China, Hong Kong, India, and Singapore. 
the fintech vendors we surveyed operated across more than a dozen different segments. So we had a, a really good pulse check on, you know, essentially the fintech ecosystem as a whole. We talked to payment processors, money transfer businesses, um, those that operated in the lending space, those providing investment services, digital banking, and then there was a long tail of uh, additional fintech segments like crypto, open banking, uh, B2B payment services, insurance, and, and the list sort of goes on and on there. Uh, we spoke with a broad range of company stages, uh, all the way from pre-seed companies, those that you know were just coming out of stealth mode, all the way up to Series D and exit stage. And we spoke with a very senior respondent base. We talked to VPs, uh, C-suite, uh, or, or founder roles within these fintech vendors. So to kick us off here, um, it was interesting last year uh, in the inaugural study, we fielded this uh, you know, really for the first time uh, on the backside of COVID as um, you know, we were really starting to see digital adoption accelerate. And th that kind of came to life in a pretty big way in the findings this year. And you know, what consumers are increasingly telling us is that the direction of travel and commerce is digital. Now, 58% of consumers globally told us they plan to spend the majority of their discretionary income online this year. That jumps all the way up to 69% of millennials. As you can see in the chart here, it's as high as 79% in markets like India. An important caveat on this chart, we are talking about discretionary spending. So non-discretionary, still largely card present, though you know, we have seen some pretty notable shifts there in areas like grocery during the pandemic. But really the takeaway, uh, the, kind of the, the action item to walk away with on this slide is that digital is becoming the first and, and many times the only touch point that a merchant or a business is going to have with many of their customers. And as those customers go digital, they're looking for ways to make things easier and faster, right? Even if that end product or service is still procured in the physical world through an experience like buy online, pick up in store. They're seeking out different ways to streamline that journey and really to remove friction uh, along the path to purchase. And of course, one of the ways that they're doing that is by adopting digital payment methods, and they're doing this very quickly. Uh, we saw in the study that 74% of digital payment users began using for the very first time less than three years ago. So this is a pretty nascent user base, uh, to, to be quite frank. It's one that, uh, again, was built largely on the back of the pandemic. And you know, we, we all know the narrative, right? As, as lockdowns went into place in 2020, we saw consumers thinking more about social distancing. They were adopting things like contact was payments for the first time. We saw you know, whole swaths of the population that maybe were not active in e-commerce before now going online and using things like digital wallets to make their lives easier. We saw segments of the population that might have been exchanging cash or checks with family members around birthdays, gravitating towards things like P2P payment apps because they simply couldn't see their family. And we saw a lot of segments of the population that you know, we probably wouldn't have associated with digital payments coming online very quickly. And it's interesting, in the early days of the pandemic, PayPal's fastest growing customer segment were consumers above the age of 50. Um, in markets like Latin America, we saw you know, quite literally tens of millions of consumers using their credit and debit card online for the first time, right? So lots of new user activation. And we're seeing consumers gravitate to you know, a whole variety of payment methods, as you can see on this chart. 53% uh, of consumers globally tell us they've used digital wallets over the past 90 days. 29% have used buy now, pay later, which as many of us know, has been an incredibly fast growing area within the payments ecosystem. 40% have used P2P payment services. And then as we look at uh, Asia, which is indicated by the, the yellow bar on the chart here, really leading the pack as we'd expect they would across all of these areas. 70% uh, of consumers based in Asia tell us they've used a digital wallet, for instance. So I, I think we're kind of at the point where it's pretty safe to say that digital payments have become ubiquitous across many markets around Around the world. Probably not a statement we could have made in 2019, but we've seen so much change since then. And you know, we're at the point as well where usage of fintech apps in general, um, you know, investment apps, banking apps, et cetera, also ubiquitous. We saw in the survey 87% of consumers uh, in the UK, for example, have used at least one fintech app on their smartphone. That jumps all the way up to 98% in India. So we're starting to see that foundation for innovation, right, for further progress around digital payments and fintech really falling into place as consumers are becoming comfortable using not only payment services and banking services digitally, but through a range of different providers. And when it comes to digital payment providers, we see a pretty interesting story emerge in terms of consumer trust and preference. And it's interesting if you 
look at the media reports and, and kind of follow the, uh, you know, the conventional talk track in this space, you know, the, the common narrative is that fintechs have run away uh, with this ecosystem. Our research indicates there's still a very clear and very strong opportunity for banks to more directly participate. We asked users of each type of digital payment service, which type of provider they'd most prefer to use it from. And actually what we saw is that banks ranked as the number one most preferred provider across all categories, uh, with the exception of buy now, pay later, where actually interestingly merchants emerged as the most preferred provider. When we look at this story around trust, it, we see an even stronger story um, where banks are outpacing all providers across all digital payment categories by a pretty strong margin. And what that telegraphs to me is that even if the bank isn't the primary provider of a digital payment service, their endorsement, their support is going to be crucial for driving adoption. There's a reason that somebody like Apple went to the card issuers to launch Apple Pay, right? It would have been very difficult to drive adoption if the Apple card were the only card available in the wallet. And I think the other takeaway here is just to look at all the colors on this chart. Um, you know, there is reasonably strong distribution uh, in terms of preference and in terms of trust across tech companies, fintechs, banks, and merchants. So what that tells me is there's room for multiple players to compete here. Um, you know, this isn't going to be a winner takes all type of uh, you know opportunity, right? That there is room for participation across all of these different segments, and we'll continue to see a whole variety of different companies look to make inroads in areas like buy now, pay later, P 2 P, digital wallets, etc. When we look at the adoption drivers for digital payment services. This is a story that really has been consistent over you know, roughly the past decade that I've been covering this space. And it's very much aligned to a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's, it's interesting, right? Because you have those basic needs, which would be things like security, ease of use, speed, convenience, acceptance. Those are sort of your prerequisites for adoption. Um, you can see that called out in the, the light orange highlighted box on the slide there. Um, those are the factors that consumers are going to look like at, at the, look for at the most basic level before they make that adoption decision. Once those are met, it's about the psychological needs, or in this case, it's value adds, right? It's things like contactless, rewards, uh, multi-country support. And, and then finally, you hit that self-actualization stage, or uh, in our case, this is going to be recommendations. It's recommendations from your bank, from your friends, from your family. And my takeaway here is that really any marketing or messaging around digital payments, before you get to the value add, before you get to kind of the big picture, first need to hit on those basic needs. How is this payment offering faster than what's available in the market? How is it more secure? How is it easier to use? Those are the things that are going to grab a consumer's attention. And then from there, you build a story around the value adds. And certainly can't overstate the importance of uh, securing personal information as part of that messaging. It continues to be the number one adoption inhibitor for digital payments. It's largely an education issue, and it's important to put technologies that we have in our industry, things like biometrics, like tokenization, into language that the consumer is going to understand. And I think it also kind of needs to be an additive story. You know, how are digital payment methods building on the pre-existing uh, protections that are available in the market, things like you know, zero fraud liability guarantee that, that we're already um, accessing through our existing payment credentials and then layering on the additional security value adds on top of that through digital payments. Uh, what's great about the high levels of digital payment and fintech app adoption that we've seen in the survey here is that it really puts in place this foundation for our industry to go deeper and to add even more value. And as consumers gain comfort with using basic digital payment capabilities like a wallet or a peer-to-peer -peer payment app, they become more primed to adopt a range of different emerging use cases. And we're seeing a glimpse of some of that here uh, in terms of what resonated with respondents in the survey. Real-time payments, um, that's becoming prolific very quickly, especially as we've seen in markets like India with UPI, we're seeing it in Brazil with PIX, we're seeing it in dozens of markets around the world. And we saw strong interest here, um, actually in the U.S., and we saw a very meaningful uh, jump over our 2021 survey where more consumers are starting to get um, you know, up to speed with the concept of real-time payments. And the pragmatic use cases in particular are the ones that are resonating. It's things like payouts, 
bill pay, account to account transfers. Looking at open banking, again, it's also about the pragmatic use cases. Consumers want easier credit applications. They want a single view of all their accounts. They want to onboard into new experiences faster. Um, you know, as somebody that just bought a house, um, you know, I can tell you that there would have been a whole lot of value in having open banking, right? Not having to take screenshots of my bank statements, not having to pull PDFs on a pretty much daily basis, right? Wouldn't it be great if I could securely give uh, a third party access to my accounts to get the information that they need. Biometrics, uh, we saw some really compelling interest here actually in cards with embedded biometric readers. We've seen that rolled out in some markets for um, for high net worth individuals, but it, it's a concept that seems to be resonating more broadly than just that audience. Um, also seeing in-store palm reader technology at checkout. Um, we see that today with experiences like Amazon One. That's something that is top of mind for consumers. Looking at connected commerce and again, kind of continuing that Amazon theme, uh, just walk out purchase experiences where there's no checkout process, you're not queuing up, um, something that consumers uh, are seeing value in. Automatic payments, you, you might see this today with a printer, for instance, that will auto reorder toner. Um, when levels get to a certain point, consumers are looking for you know these payment experiences that just sort of blend into the background that make their lives easier. We're seeing that around smart home purchases as well. And then finally, we saw some really good interest in next-gen card experiences, um, specifically things like having loyalty credentials linked to a payment card. A lot of us might know that experience today with Square, um, where you know, your, your card is actually the anchor uh, for your loyalty credential, your loyalty account with a particular merchant. We're seeing uh, interest in personalized offers based on spending patterns, um, cards that can perform multiple functions. Maybe it's your credit card that also serves as a transit card and a gym card. Um, you know, use cases that I imagine are, are pretty relevant, especially for some of the key players in that ecosystem, like a Jamalto or an Idemia. So, so point being, right, no shortage of interest for consumers around different types of future possibilities in our industry. And if we remember that digital payment adoption drivers chart, it's largely the use cases that are focused on fundamentals that are driving interest. It's making payments faster, making payments more secure, easier to use, more readily available. And when we flip the coin and look at this uh, from the fintech vendor standpoint, as this ecosystem is expanding, as it's diversifying, a big objective with our research was to really understand the emerging areas where fintechs are looking to target in the future with the idea of trying to pinpoint specific use cases that show near-term potential, as well as to see where some of that overlap is occurring with consumer interest. And we identified a fair number of interest, uh, interesting areas where um, you know there's actually quite a bit of appetite for fintechs to go a layer deeper. Uh, no surprise, embedded finance, and we're seeing this happen in both directions, by the way. It's you know fintechs using banking as a service or payments as a service partners to offer, let's say, a, a payment processing capability or, or a card issuance capability. Um, you're seeing that today with Square using somebody like a Marketa uh, for card issuance. But we're also seeing some players like Stripe or Monzo say, Saying, hey, we built something really great here. Let's offer it on an as a service basis. And what's interesting about embedded finance is we used to traditionally think of fintech as somewhat of a vertical opportunity. And fintech companies, by our definition at that time, were sort of these dedicated providers of financial services. Maybe they were offering a P2P app or a digital wallet. Today, fintech has become much more horizontal. And you're really starting to see companies across verticals, both B2B and B2C embedding fintech into the software, into the applications, into the experiences that they're already serving up to their customers. And when we look at embedded finance, we saw use cases like payment processing, offering bank accounts, even offering payroll services as ones that were particularly top of mind for fintechs. Uh, on the topic of connected commerce, really the idea here is around the internet of things and using connected devices to expand the acceptance network. You're seeing interest in both use cases like bringing payments to appliances, but also interest in the underlying infrastructure that's needed in IoT, things like touchless authentication, blockchain-based data sharing, open banking, very similar to the consumer survey, lots of interest here um, around payments use cases like account-based payments, but also a number of connectivity use cases, things like account linking and performing credit risk assessments. And finally, on the topic of crypto, you know, notably less interest than some of the other areas in the survey, but still three in five fintechs stating that they see relevance to their business, especially around use cases like potentially processing crypto transactions, issuing a, a card um, that's tied to, let's say, a crypto exchange, um, crypto trading, right, bringing in more more capabilities into their existing suite of services. 
the consistent message that we saw throughout the survey was really an appetite to partner. And I think you know that's probably more important than ever given the current macroeconomic environment. And what we saw in the survey, 98% of fintechs identified areas where they believe their business could benefit from the support of a partner. So it isn't this you know us versus them mentality that we so often see gets painted around this space. There's a recognition for the value of partners. And we're seeing that in a really big way in the research. Uh, and in particular, partnerships that provide access to customers, that provide access to capital, um, which is certainly top of mind right now, uh, and partnerships that provide access to marketing support. Uh, those are areas that that are definitely resonating um, for incumbents, right? Areas that certainly they can lend a hand and play up in their partner outreach efforts. And there's also a clear emphasis on technology-centric partnerships, um, things like core infrastructure development, things like technology enablement. You know, fintechs uh, largely looking for partners that can equip them with some of the core technologies that you know perhaps it wouldn't make sense to build in-house. As part of our research, we conducted about a dozen in-depth interviews with fintechs um, of different stages across different segments, different countries. And these are some of the consistent themes that we heard from fintechs about what they're looking for in a partner. And I won't go through these in, in laborious detail, but just to kind of give you the flyby speed and urgency. Um, you know, we talked to a, a large digital bank uh, over in the UK that you know, alluded to the fact that they're very fast paced, right? They're looking for a partner that also has that, that fast paced mentality that has speed and urgency to get something to market. Ease of integration. Um, we were talking to a payment processor also in the UK um, that you know is built using modern product development techniques, and they're looking for partners that you know are using modern architecture that can work with them um, and, and sort of collaborate in a similar environment. Uh, commitment to the partnership. You know, we saw this over and over again, where um, you know many times there are partnerships that are announced in the market that you know, don't make it beyond the press release. Right, really a need for partners that have that long-term mentality that are looking to bring. Uh, something into the marketplace that is actually going to be tangible actually adds value. Scalability was another big theme that we heard time and time again. Um, you know, they certainly are open to doing a, an MVP type of uh, model, but you know, they want a roadmap to expand that. Right? They want to see how they can move this beyond just one country into multiple markets, move it beyond one customer segment into their broader business. And approachability and navigability. Um, th this was an interesting one that you know, we especially heard from some of the smaller fintech where they just have a challenging time finding the front door uh, when it comes to partnering with larger financial services providers and, and really looking to better understand what is the entry point, right? How do we have that initial conversation? Who do we talk to? Where do we turn? Um, and then finally, as we move down the home stretch here, and again, th this message continues to pop up, but it, it isn't that disintermediation story when it comes to the card payments ecosystem. The, the overarching message is that most fintechs uh, see payment networks as partners. They have a deep reliance on them for their strategy and operation. You know, certainly some fintechs do have aspirations to become alternatives to the networks. That's you know not a secret to anybody. But what we saw is that 66% tell us they view the networks as partners. There's a deep appreciation for their central role in the value chain. 97% say they're either reliant on the networks today or they expect to be in the future. So you know, clearly um, a, a very pervasive role in this ecosystem. And so I think the message is this, right? For any company that plays an enablement role in the card payments ecosystem today, whether you're a network or, or you're a partner that's connected into the networks, there's an opportunity to collaborate with fintechs. There's an opportunity to more deeply uh, connect them with, with different types of card payments use cases. And as we saw earlier, um, you know, fintechs are, are really after partners that can bring them customers. Um, you know, let's face it, right? No shortage of customers that are plugged into the card payments ecosystem today. So just to distill what we've covered, um, you know, we're seeing consumers gravitate towards fintech, towards digital payments in a very big way to streamline their digital journeys. And as more of their interactions are going digital, they're looking for trusted experiences. They're looking for experiences that remove friction, that create different types of value. When we talk to fintechs, they want partners. They want partners that can help them deliver and consume different types of embedded financial experiences. And really the trend that we're seeing is that fintech is becoming embedded in every company and, and fintech vendors need partners to drive that opportunity forward. And then finally, um, at the end of the day, you know, fundamentals are, are really at the heart of success in fintech. Um, it's things like collaboration, it's things like security, it's things like user experience, things that have always been important in payments and banking, right? These are critical focal points for any fintech initiative in the market.
So uh, with that, we will move here into our panel discussion um, and, and we'll reintroduce our panelists, Trib, Greg, and Joanna. Guys, thanks again for joining us. Um, so let's kick things off here. As, as you saw uh, across a number of slides, um, collaboration was a, a very important message that emanated from the research, sort of this better together mentality um, that we saw over and over again. It'd be great to hear from each of you how networks like um, like Discover, Discover Global Network and FinTechs can work together to deliver on some of these evolving consumer demands and, and different emerging trends that I discussed previously. Um, Joanna, maybe if we could start with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, great question. So um, with a lot of what you just went through and talked about, you know, things like the acceleration of digital pay payments and kind of the rapid pace of change we're seeing in our industry, I think it's really um, almost impossible for us as a bank, an issuer, and a network to build everything that we need internally. So for us, partnerships are a critical way that we can bring these emerging capabilities to our issuers, our merchants, our acquirers, and our customers. Um, I also think on that note that Discover is a great partner for um, fintechs to work with. Um, I think that our unique business model, um, that we are a global card network, um, as well as one of the largest U.S. card issuers, um, but we are evolving um, as a, a digital bank and offering more digital banking um, solutions to customers. Um, and that unique business model makes us a really exciting company for fintechs to partner with. That's well said. Trib, what's your perspective? No, I agree with uh, uh, what uh, Joanna just said. I mean, everybody's aware that you know the the, the pace of change over the last few years, especially, uh, uh, has been uh, absolutely huge, and especially we're seeing uh, a lot of convergence of uh, of the technology and uh, uh, that's enabling new use cases. And the focus these days is about customer experience and the customer journey is how we take the customer from, as you said, from you know getting or thinking about a financial product to actually going into uh, uh, and getting it. And this is where you know uh, we, I mean, we are a bank, we provide solutions, but not everybody can do everything themselves. So this is where partnerships become very, very important for us, uh, especially with the fintechs who are developing new uh, solution to solve problems or create you know, uh, uh, new use cases. Uh, so our approach from an international perspective is not only to be able to provide the global reach of our network, but also uh, to look at what new models that are emerging and how uh, we explore these solutions for uh, those, uh, those models uh, from our existing products or create new products and services uh, uh, for those segments. I mean, I've talked before uh, in previous webinars about uh, 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 our approach, which is we not only look at payments, but it, it's not just, let me just go back, it's not just a fintechs, it's existing card schemes, existing domestic schemes, et cetera, that require those partnerships as well. So I've talked previously about network alliance approach that we have where we not, where we enable domestic card schemes uh, with operating regulations and be able to expand their cards cross borders. Uh, then we look at uh, now the alternative issuing models that we have where we're working with fintechs to provide solutions for uh, uh, their existing uh, clients or for the uh, new use cases. Then uh, there's a whole third area where we differentiate or different from uh, other schemes is where we leverage our technology. So we license our technology. So uh, uh, Jordan, you talked about uh, the whole you know multi-use cards, right? So we have the our EMB technology, which is called DPASS Connect. We, we can license them to partners where they you know, uh, provide the business case and the, uh, everything stacks up. But the idea is that they, they could use that to not only create a credit card, but link in loyalty, link in transit, link in you know, your insurance, your uh, rewards, all those things could be in one place, right? And so there's a number of areas uh, that uh, we can partner, uh, partner in and support uh, uh, the FinTechs and other examples I can, uh, talk through is we talk about BNPL. It's how we take a, a BNPL product and combine with the benefits of a credit card. So you take a credit card, but instead of a revolving credit, it becomes an installment type payment, right? It's how we take B2B use cases. 
So I can go on about this <laughs> all day long, but I think in the interest of time, uh, I'll stop there. Yeah, th those are great examples, Trib, and particularly like that one around the the, techno the technology licensing capability. I think that ties into the theme of embedded finance really well. Um, Greg, mm -hmm. let's uh, let's wrap up with you on your take here. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I, I think Joanna and Trib have said it really well. Um, being able to partner, we realize is critical. Um, so there's been a lot of fragmentation and there's specialization in the ecosystem. So emergent players are really strong or most times best in class uh, on the part of the con consumer journey um, or value chain that they're focused on. So whether that's something like doing fraud or loyalty or insights. So being able to take those, um, you know, those best in class experiences and those pieces, uh, being able to uh, partner with those players while still rendering a seamless experience to the end, end user uh, is gonna be more key than ever. Thanks, Greg. And uh, just a reminder to our audience, please feel free to submit questions throughout. We can tackle those towards the uh, latter half of the panel discussion here. Uh, so moving on, though, you know, one of the, the most important drivers of innovation, you know, from my perspective is in, in information exchange. And, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, we go to conferences like Money 2020. And I know most of us on the line here right now we're at, at that event. It, it's the ability to share perspectives across different sets of stakeholders that you know, maybe have a, a different vantage point than you. That can be hugely impactful for driving progress and, and really for understanding how a particular trend or technology is gonna play out across you know, the ecosystem more broadly. And I guess what I'd be curious to hear more about is how networks can help fintechs and you know better understand emerging trends, given that that centralized role that you have in the value chain. And I imagine that's probably a two-way street as well, right? Fintechs also have a role to play in helping uh, networks like Discover understand how the space is evolving. Um, Trip, maybe we can start with you, and, and you can share some thoughts there. Yeah, and Jordan, I completely agree with you. The learning has to be both ways, right? Nobody's an expert, so we need to learn from the trends that uh, because the fintechs are in that space, they're doing that every day. They're looking at some of the, uh, uh, the new items and use, use cases. So we need to learn from them and then we can provide our expertise uh, uh, to them. I mean, if I think about uh, the challenges that face a lot of the fintechs, in fact, I was having a conversation with uh, a company earlier today and they're saying that when they work with their uh, fintech partners, the biggest challenge is regulation, is understanding regulations in the in various markets. So if I just start at that level with the change uh, in regulations, how regulations impact the product or service uh, that the uh, the fintech partners are you know wanting to launch, what do they need to be aware of, how do they meet the compliance uh, requirements, right? So that's just a you know starting to uh, at, the, at, at the starting uh, point for launching any product or service. And then you already talked about uh, when uh, you said what are fintechs looking for, you know, scale was one of the things is the brand awareness is how do the networks help them scale their product or service, take it cross borders and make it international. It's how that brand awareness builds, right? So those are some of the uh, areas where networks uh, can be pretty active uh, and pretty supportive. And then the whole area around the, the financing. You know, everybody needs money to grow, to launch. Uh, that's where networks can uh, help as well in terms of investment, in terms of uh, you know, incentivization, in terms of uh, launch uh, support. So there's various things uh, uh, that, can, that uh, the networks can help support uh, the fintech partners. And it depends on motivation as well as to what is the requirements for the partners? What are they looking for? You know, I just talked about all the things we typically see, but it's what is their motivation uh, 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 for, for the partnership and what they are looking for. But as we said at the beginning, learning work, but, uh, works both ways, uh, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities for us to do that together. Well said. Greg, your perspective. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it, it definitely a, t a two-way street uh, be, would be disingenuous to say that that any one party or you know, even we have all the answers um, from from the network side i'll state the obvious uh, we play obviously a central role um, we're connector facilitator we're having a lot of discussions that trip mentioned um, we also have a lot of data flowing through the network so while it's not the same as maybe what an, a merchant and an issuer see at that granular level um, at a macro lens um, we're able to see different trends as they start to arise so i think um, you know jordan you mentioned you know some of the trends we saw at the beginning of the pandemic as an example. 
um, you know, kind of extrapolate that out just maybe more broadly, we can see different trends uh, through the data that we that we have. From a fintech perspective, I've mentioned the specialization uh, that that that's out there. So um, really, you know, fintechs that are focused on solving a particular consumer pain point, um, and they can have a really deep understanding of that pain point. Um, you know, if you take those things together, um, the deep understanding of the consumer uh, particular uh, issue that they're solving with a more um, you know, macro view and the data and products and services that a network has, such as Discover Global Network, um, end users can, uh, stand to benefit uh, and, and benefit from the continued innovation that takes place. And, and Jordan, See, you uh, both, sorry, sorry, just to, to, to interrupt, but one of the things that you had mentioned when you were speaking was the whole connected commerce and IoT. And this is where our experience uh, uh, you know, from the network perspective comes in very useful because we, we provide the card rails that can help all those type of transactions and make that pretty invisible to the end consumer, make the consumer experience much better, make the whole payment uh, invisible using the, uh, the card rails and make it more secure, right? So that's what the, uh, the network, uh, uh, networks can provide uh, for those type of solutions. Yeah, it's actually a really nice transition trip into sort of my next line of questioning here, because the, the theme that we continue to see over and over again is that, you know, when fintechs are partnering with trusted established players in the space, it's it's sort of this one plus one equals three story where you can mm -hmm. actually provide an even deeper level of value. Um, and, and Greg, going back to some of the comments you made, I, I was wondering if we could maybe just double click on that and, and you could share some of the thoughts on Discover's role to play in sparking you know, further innovation with some of the fintechs and some of the partners that you have in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I actually, you know, some of the things that you mentioned as you walked, walked us through here at the beginning of the, the findings from the study uh, that really resonated with me and would be a way to kind of uh, look at this is, is around the need for flexibility and partners. So fintechs have a need for flexibility. Uh, I think one thing that you would you would know in working with Discover Global Network or, or our partners know is that we are extremely flexible, uh, flexible and able. Um, we're really quite literally willing to look at any and all of the assets that we have to help our partners solve their commerce challenges. Um, so if a partner has an opportunity where they feel that a network or even our issuing side uh, or you know bank side of the business can help, we're more than open to co-creation. So while we have products and services that are out there, uh, that doesn't mean that's kind of the end of it. If, if there's a you know something that can be solved by working with a partner such as DGN, we should have those conversations. Um, another theme that arose in the study um, that really you know spoke to me was around fintechs needing the ease of integration. Um, you know, that's one, I would say historically, we've done a lot powering big tech partners behind the scenes on a lot of things that they do. Um, but I think ease of integration um, and, you know, our journey there to continue to make it easier to work with us is an area that we have been and will continue to invest in. I think we have a big opportunity to work with even more fintech partners than we, than we are today. Um, so I think if you couple the flexibility that we believe that we have as a, you know, one of the strong suits that uh, DGN has with that um, uh, you know, ease of integration that we continue to, to work on, um, that is going to spark even more innovation uh, with our partners. And again, we'll, we'll ultimately benefit consumers. Mm. So Trib, I, I want to go back to a theme that you had mentioned a little bit earlier around global reach. And that was definitely something that, that came up in our research where we saw that fintechs are looking for partners that can support them across multiple geographies, um, potentially you know, using them as, as a partner to, uh, to enter a new market, let's say. Um, Discover Global Network, you know, headquartered here in the US where I'm based, hopefully most on the line recognize that the network has a global reach. It is, it is in the name, right? Discover Global Network. Um, yes. Trib, maybe you could discuss a bit about how FinTechs outside the US are collaborating with DGN and, and the type of value that you can bring to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, uh, as, as Greg said, uh, you know, uh, we uh, when we partner, we are flexible in terms of how we operate and this is the feedback we typically get from all the partners that we were fintech partners that we're working with it's our flexibility and some of the things uh, jordan you mentioned the ease of integration commitment to partnership scalability approachability and speed and urgency right all of the above 
is what the partners uh, take uh, uh, us for as that's where we, we are, we are uh, in a, a good and work with them. Uh, and from the global, uh, uh, you know, we have a dedicated team uh, here in EMEA region, in London, where I'm based, and also in Asia Pacific. But Discover Global Network, uh, as it says, is global. And as I mentioned also earlier, we have our Dynas Club network, which is global. But then we have network alliance partnerships uh, across the world as well. We have about 29 uh, network alliance partnership with domestic schemes. So it is not just, you know, working with a, a number of banks that work directly with Discover is the domestic scheme, which means if there's a domestic scheme in India, that's most of the Indian banks will be working with that domestic scheme. So we take our solutions not only within uh, within Discover, but also out to uh, our network alliance partners, right? So that opens up a uh, a, a lot of the, uh, the opportunities. Uh, then we also help our partners uh, move, uh, grow uh, you know, with the uh, geographic expansions, for example, I've had conversations with my counterparts in the US who have uh, partners who want to expand into Europe. It's how we help them expand into Europe. And same thing, you know, European partners wanting to move into the US market. So we, we use our network, we use, use our partnerships uh, uh, to uh, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis to see where the opportunities are, where we can make the introductions, where we can actually go in as joint partners. I, I'll use one example. Uh, we uh, launched a program uh, uh, earlier this year uh, with a, a B2B um, company that provided software uh, services uh, for in the travel industry. They were looking to launch a, a, a new uh, payment product for distribution, fulfillment, and payments in the travel business to bring in cost efficiencies to reduce the settlement times. So they approached us, and we then partnered with them we had conversations, we brought in an issuing processor and a, uh, a, a EMI bin sponsor, put the three together plus us, four companies together, we built the solution and launched that in February this year. So those are the type of things we can do, whereas a company that is not in the payments business, that's doing completely different things, but we help them enable uh, and launch their payment product uh, in the market. Similar, uh, similarly with you know, uh, if you look at BNPL type opportunities uh, or you know, faster onboarding processes with our partner banks, we brought in partners who can help them uh, uh, you know, fast track the onboarding process. So from where they used to take 15 days to from application to issuing a card, reducing down to two or three days. So again, number of examples we can talk through, but it's utilizing the bandwidth and the, the size of the network and the partnerships we have, we can enable that. Sorry, a long answer to a short question, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's great, Trib. Really nice examples there. And, and you both have talked you know, quite a bit about um, Discover's value proposition for fintechs and, and really what you bring to the table um, around a partnership opportunity. Joanna, I'd be interested in sort of the other direction. What does Discover Global Network look for and, and what types of qualities make a good partner um, in your eyes? Yeah, so um, I think you talked a little bit about uh, in the study that fintechs were looking for partners that have a commitment to the partnership. And I think really similarly, uh, we're looking for that as well, uh, interested in working with fintechs that want a true partnership uh, with Discover and that are also looking for kind of win-win relationships uh, where there's commercial opportunities that benefit both organizations and where both companies support each other's goals. And um, I think we're also interested in partnering with companies that kind of share our, um, our values as an organization, um, particularly with a strong focus on customer needs and you know, delivering the right experience to our customers. Um, I think we have a relentless focus on the customer at Discover, and so uh, partnering with companies that um, share that is really important. We also, um, we talk a lot internally about um, 
discover behaviors and how we, you know, aspire to act as an organization. And one of the, one of the ones that we talk about is that we get better every day. So we're really focused on continuous improvement and um, commitment to kind of refining and optimizing what we do every day to make it better and better and finding partners that are able to do that with us and help us do that and that we can help them uh, do that within their organization as well. I think that's um, great. And then the last thing I'd add there that we look for in a partner is someone who really understands what's happening in the market and is able to fill you know, a unique customer need in the space. Um, I think, um, yeah, those are the big things that I would call out in terms of what we're seeking from a partnership. Yeah, I really love your point on uh, continuous improvement. Um, yeah, this is a space that's just moving so quickly. You can't be stagnant, right? It's it's an ongoing exercise in optimization and finding partners that have that same vision around optimization and continuously improving um, it is the way that you provide deeper value. So I thought that was really well said. So as we um, we wrap things up here, I thought it'd be great to finish with a, a bit of an outlook and, and sort of the ever important view into the future not going to force you guys to make a prediction. Um, instead, I'm just curious about, you know, sort of the fintech trends that excite you as you think about the next few years. What is that trend that's top of mind for you? Um, and why are you thinking about it? Why do you think it's going to be impactful? So, um, Joanna, since you've got the mic here, um, uh, I'll start off with you. Yeah, so I'd say um, there's two kind of more general trends that really excite me. So the first is kind of the convergence of the capabilities. So I think we're seeing more and more capabilities that build on top of each other and kind of have a snowball effect. And I think that's really exciting because I think it just creates infinite possibilities for um, ways that we can bring better experiences to the market and to customers. Um, so I think that's something that, that makes me really excited. Um, and then the second kind of general trend that I'm excited about is the ability to create these really differentiated customer experiences. So um, a lot of the things you talked about, about taking the friction out of the payment experience where it really kind of falls into the background and the customer is just doing the thing they want to do um, and um, making that as easy as possible. Um, I think there's also places where um, we get better customer experiences through different integration with merchants by pre creating better uh, fraud experiences um, and even like more personalized payment experiences and rewards experiences. All of those things, I think, um, can really shift the customer experience and drive a lot of kind of loyalty and engagement from our customers, which really excites me. Yeah, plus one on the uh, the di differentiated customer experiences. I think the more that you can do to add additional layers of value on top of the payment, um, right, the, the deeper the level of engagement that you have with your customers. So that's a great point. Um, Greg, what are your thoughts? Um, so I'm a big big believer uh, in the power of open banking, open finance, um, both as a payments payments guy for, for a long time here and then also as a consumer. So uh, the idea that a consumer, uh, you know, owns their own data um, and can freely and securely access it and share it with a third party for value, for, you know, for them, that's a powerful idea. And it's, it's exciting to me. Um, you know, again, in, in both both aspects, I think it kind of hits on what Joanna mentioned. It, it leads to better experiences, so it leads to better experiences from a consumer perspective. Um, it also has better experiences from a business perspective. So, uh, from a, like on the consumer side, you know, streamline onboarding and account opening, um, uh, revenue and affordability based lending. Uh, you kind of mentioned Jordan, the you know buying a house, like being able to share that data. Um, you know, you know more, more seamlessly than the kind of the archaic way we, we tend to do it uh, is, is a lot better. Um, and then, you know, I think getting those customized and tailored offers for you um, specifically to the data that you have that isn't just sit with your FI is, is, is pretty cool. Um, you know, from the business side, rapid business underwriting, embedded payments, kind of hear those terms um, all kind of derived off of the open finance, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer of it. I, I'm, I'm very excited about where we head to here, uh, you know, both uh, from in, in the world as well as what, what continues to kind of evolve here in the U.S. 
Yeah. And on the open banking front, I mean, it, it looks like at least here in the U.S., we are finally uh, making some initial steps down that path based on some of the comments from the CFPB a few weeks ago. So a few interesting years in store for us on that front. Uh, Trib, I will let you take us home. Um, no, I think uh, I, I agree with both Joanna and, uh, and Greg. I think uh, open banking, uh, embedded finance. I mean, those were the things I've been talking about for the last couple of years, but I think moving forward, and it goes back to the theme of uh, the customer journey uh, uh, and the whole overall experience and making the payments invisible, right? So that's, that will come through when we get uh, from open banking to open finance and once we get from open finance to open data, right? That's when the whole control of data ownership by the by me or you for, for your own data, that adds value and that can bring in a lot of uh, you know, uh, different services. Uh, and then how the banks and the fintechs can collaborate, whether that's banking as a service or platform banking, right? So who provides the service, who owns the customer, that's something that can, uh, that can be worked out. But I think those are the areas that will drive uh, uh, what we see in the market over the next few years. But let's not forget amongst all this new stuff that there's still your traditional payments uh, uh, stuff that still needs to be done. So I think there's still some of the trends that will be there, especially in the commercial and B2B space, uh, would be how you uh, simplify uh, the payments, uh, the B2B payments. You know, how do we take what was in the consumer space, the recurring payments, how do we make the variable recurring payments, help businesses to settle, you know, uh, the payments, uh, you know, uh, so, how we take virtual card numbers, et cetera. So those type of things I think still will be there for the next uh, few years. And I think that's where we'll see more value added on the commercial uh, uh, and business to business payments through the existing uh, stuff. But uh, to me, uh, let's see what open finance and open data bring to us uh, in the new years. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo all of your comments. I mean, those are, are definitely top of mind trends. Um, I imagine for, for just about everybody up and down the payments value chain. Um, and for me, I, I guess the one that is most um, impactful or, or at least has the potential to be the most impactful is, is this concept of embedded finance. I mean, really, you know, what we're seeing is sort of this evolution of the distribution model for financial mm -hmm. services where Increasingly, it's third parties, right? It's it's non banks that are looking to embed different types of financial capabilities into their software, into their applications to mm -hmm. better engage with their customers, to drive revenue, to create a stickier experience. And as those companies increasingly head down the path of embedded finance, they need partners, right? It, it is continuing to bring to life the importance of partnerships. They need entities that can provide the underlying infrastructure, that can provide um, the, the experience, right, around how to operate a financial product. And so as that trend unfolds, I, I think it, it, one, it increases the overall size of the fintech market and opportunity, but two, it creates just so many new opportunities for um, existing players to offer up their expertise, their services, their capabilities to, um, to bring all that to life. So interesting times ahead here. Um, so we do have a, a bit of time for Q&A. Um, I, I do see one that has come in, um, so I will jump on that. Uh, and this is actually pretty well aligned with uh, a point that I had brought up on the slide where I featured some of those quotes from our in-depth interviews. And uh, this particular uh, person is asking, how can emerging FinTech companies get on Discover's radar to explore collaboration opportunities? Um, wh where is the front door and, and how do they reach you all? Uh, Joanna, maybe if we could ask you to start off on that one. Yeah, so uh, a great question. And um, I love that that came in because we really truly are um, really interested in hearing from new partners. So uh, definitely want to connect with all of you. Um, so Discover attends a lot of industry events um, and conferences. Those are always a great place to reach us. Um, if you see a Discover booth at an event, uh, definitely stop by and chat with us. Um, and then more directly, um, for our corporate strategy team at Discover, um, you can also email us directly at investorrelations at discover.com. Um, and that's a great way to get in touch with um, my team. That's great. Uh, Trib, anything you'd add there? Uh, no, and uh, Joanna said it all. We, we participate in uh, a number of events. So we are uh, sponsors of Money 2020 US, Money 2020 in Europe. Uh, a number of other uh, industry conferences uh, uh, and events. So that's a place to connect with us. Uh, but also, 
uh, you know, uh, just uh, we have our, I think, email on uh, on Discover Global Network website. So just ping us an email and we'll, we'll be in touch. That's great. So it, it looks like we're pretty much at time here. So probably best to uh, close things out. Give folks back a minute or two. Uh, Joanna Tribb, Greg, uh, a big thanks to all of you for your perspectives. You shared some really nice examples of how Discover is participating in the ecosystem, the value you're providing, uh, what you're looking for in terms of partners. Um, big thanks to your company, uh, Discover Global Network, for collaborating with us on this annual research effort. And of course, thanks to everybody on the webinar today for joining us. Um, mm -hmm. Stay well. We'll look forward to sharing more with you soon on the FinTech ecosystem, uh, as well as some of the findings from the study. So at this point, Malik, I will bring it over to you to close us out. Thanks, Jordan. That concludes our webinar for today. Uh, thank you, Jordan, Craig, Joanna, and Tripp. As a reminder, the on-demand version of this event will be available shortly on behalf of Discover Financial Services and 451 Research. Thank you for attending and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, all.